So just to get that formality out of the way, uh, I really want to uh, thank everyone who has attended on Zoom. I want to thank our two panelists. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Ward. I am the executive director of the Los Altos History Museum, or as Perlita taught us, we say, I'm the executive director of Los Altos History Museum without the redundant the in there, which is kind of, so we did, we've changed that on all of our letters um, and, and uh, tried to across the board on our website too. It was really good feedback. So the Los Santos History Museum is um, excited to have opportunities to have conversations of, of that increase our empathy and our understanding in our community with the diversity that has always been part of this area. And it isn't always um, lifted up as, as much as we would like it to be. So we're excited to have an opportunity tonight to, to uh, delve into that. Um, the museum had a series over Zoom last year, and I'm just so pleased and excited that we could continue with that. We were calling them Community Conversations, um, our town tonight. So we are continuing with that tradition and um, delighted to have Dr. Perlita Dicochea joining me in, um, in the evening tonight. I'm gonna to be handing over the, the um, hostess role to her. Um, Perlita has been a huge assistant to me at the museum for everything we're trying to do to increase our, our empathy, our understanding, our dialogue, our outreach. Um, it's just been my honor to get to be your friend and to get to know you. Thank you so much. Uh, Perlita came to the museum as the co-curator to an exhibition we did on Juana Briones in 2018. Um, and it was, it's just been wonderful since then to uh, watch her um, growing impact in our community. Uh, she is on the county's um, historical committee, I think is the right term for it, um, for the county historic, of Santa Clara. Historic and Heritage Commission. Historic Heritage Commission, thank you. Um, and she is um, also at the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity at Stanford University for doing communications and programs. She holds a PhD from UC Berkeley Go Bears, just like me. So we were excited to have that in common. Um, and her, her dissertation in the Ethnic Studies program looked at water disputes in the borderland between California and Mexico. Um, so Perlita, it's just been great working with you. Thank you so much for coming back to the museum uh, last year as the chairperson for our diversity advisory group. Um, and I know we have a lot of work ahead of us. We're just getting going. Um, and I thank you so much for your chairmanship of that important committee. I'm gonna turn it over to you. I will still be here monitoring chat if anybody has any questions or what have you. And then at the end, I'll make some announcements asking all of you to become members of the museum if you aren't already. So, um, but for now, I'm gonna hand it over to Perlita. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for your very kind words. Um, likewise, it's been wonderful working for the museum and you know, really charting new territory with you and trying to do things different. It, it's really been a great experience and, and how cool also to develop a friendship with you. Like that's the best part, right? <laughs> you people and then you eventually are able, able to connect beyond the work which has been really nice. So um, happy new year, everybody. Thank you, Alejandro, for joining us. I'm so excited for this program. And we wanted to start with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, as many of you know, the South Coast History Museum is located within the ethno-historic Huichon territory of the ancestral unceded tribal lands of the Moet Maloney speaking people, whom were missionized in missions Santa Clara, San Francisco, and San Jose. The Muwekma Ohlone are the legal successors of the sovereign, federally recognized Verona Band of Alameda County. Um, Los Altos History Museum began integrating land acknowledgements at meetings and public programs, um, I think maybe for the last couple of years, um, pretty recently, for several reasons. Um, first, just to raise communal consciousness of our shared multiracial local histories. 
Secondly, to represent the museum's concerted effort to establish a stronger partnership with the Lone tribal leadership around specific projects and issues, including raising awareness that the Moefma continue to fight for federal recognition. And thirdly, um, among other things, to provide an important context for local histories, as will be shared in uh, Alejandro Jara's presentation today. The struggles and resilience of the Ohlone peoples inform the complexities of race relations and racial dynamics, including those that we frame under civil rights movements. So it's a significant period, moment in January as we're approaching MLK Day and thinking about civil rights uh, across various um, communities of color. Um, and, and also it's, it's a significant moment in our country's history as we will uh, address in a bit. So our speaker, Alejandro Jara, um, is working on his history, uh, PhD in history. He's a PhD candidate at the University of New Mexico. Um, he's also a lecturer currently at Santa Cruz University. And his presentation, Civil Rights in Early Silicon Valley, the Chicano Chicano Experience, um, will share in this, he'll share his research on Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicana, Chicano political efforts and various strategies to gain economic, cultural and political representation in Santa Clara County. And in his presentation, well, he will really um, share why it's important to delineate these terms and how they represent different communities and community agendas and strategies. But before we get into his formal presentation, Alejandro, I really um, wanted you to talk more about yourself and your background. Uh, you grew up in San Jose. Um, if you can describe your experience um, coming of age, coming back as a professional researcher to Santa Clara County. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Alejandro Jara. And uh, yeah, I was born and raised here in San Jose, and I've always loved where I came from. I've always loved this city. Um, I, I'm the I'm first generation, and so I was the first in my family to go to college. Uh, I went to Santa Clara University. Uh, Dr. Dicocha was actually my professor when I was here uh, at, at that time. Uh, and when I started when I really, it, it was really when I got to Santa Clara that I had the opportunity to take a class on Mexican history. Uh, I had no idea I could take a class on Mexican history. I always knew I was Mexican, uh, that I had, that I came from Mexican background. Both my parents had immigrated from Mexico and I grew up with their stories, but I had never really been formally educated on the history of where they came from. And so when I took the opportunity to take this history of modern Mexico class, it really opened my eyes to their experiences and the experiences that they struggled with in their home country before coming here and really connected with their culture more. And as a result, I began to connect with my culture myself. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I became so interested in just learning more about not just Mexico, but all of Latin America. Uh, so my, my undergraduate degree was in Latin American history. And from then on, I kind of started thinking, well, what can I do with history major? And so I decided to teach and I, I taught elementary school for two years. I taught middle school for a year, uh, but I always really wanted to teach at the high school level. And as a graduate from Bellarmine, uh, I always wanted to go back to Bellarmine, uh, private Jesuit high school here in, in San Jose. And I went to the faculty website and I looked at the qualifications and every, almost everybody there had a master's degree. So I took it upon myself to apply to master's program so that I could be a competitive candidate when applying for a position at Bellarmine. And that took me to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, once I was there, uh, my master's degree was gonna be in Latin American history, but things pivoted as I began to research more about Mexican Americans in the US Southwest than I was researching on people from Latin America. And that's why my master's degree is a major minor in Latin America and US Southwest. And then the PhD is in US Latino history because I really began to focus my, my research interest on uh, Latino communities in the United States. 
but it's so important to, to hear those, um, you know, those paths that people take. I think, you know, it's important for the audience to know that um, you are for sure, we have full confidence, you're sure uh, soon gonna be a professor um, and um, well on your way. And it's important for the audience to know that um, Latino faculty, full-time faculty make up you know, less than 3% of all faculty in the US. So it's, and then if you look at specific universities, you know, some are worse than others, right? <laughs> right? So, um, so it's still, it's still very significant um, to be in this field and be doing the work as, as a professional scholar and then focusing on these community issues of you, as you and I have talked about, San Jose has, is still understudied. So I'm so excited um, that you've chosen this for your topic, which which we are anxious to see it when it's in book form on our local local library shelves. <laughs> so thank you, um, Alejandro. I'll give you the floor now and let you give you provide your presentation, and um, I'll check back in once you wrap up for some questions, and we can gather questions from the audience. Audience, as the presentation is moving forward. And, questions might arise for you, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A feature. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation to go along with the lecture that I prepared. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. Okay, so I hope Everyone can see that. <clears throat> okay. Um, in 2010, the US Census printed a special report on Latinos and Hispanic populations in the United States. And San Jose, California had the 10th largest concentration of Latinos in the country with just over 300,000 Latinos, the majority of who were of Mexican descent. In 2014, the city became recognized as the 10th largest city in the country with nearly one third of its population being of Latino descent. Although these recognitions are recent, the growth of San Jose has a history that dates back to the middle of the 20th century under the leadership of city manager, Anthony Dutch Hammond. Under his leadership between 1950 and 1970, the city's politics were defined by massive growth, particularly through annexations. Migration of people from elsewhere in the state and the country, coupled with the settlement of foreign immigrants, accounted for much of the city's growth. However, the annexation of established communities in and around San Jose also made up a significant portion of the increased population during this time period. Between 1950 and 1970, San Jose's population jumped up dramatically from 95,000 people to about 460,000 people. To put this growth into some context, uh, some of the country's fastest growing cities during this time period were Phoenix, which increased by 100%, Miami, which increased by 89%, Houston increased by 54%, and Los Angeles increased by 50%. San, Jose, San Jose's growth outpaced all of these cities, making it the fastest growing city in the country during these 20 years. Um, perhaps more impressive than the growth of the city as a whole was the growth of San Jose's Latino population. Uh, the ethno the ethno racial demographic uh, increased from a meager 6,180 residents to nearly 98,000 during this same time period. Uh, it's important to note that even though the the figure of 6,180 seems really really small, that's because the census only counted the number of the Latinos residing in incorporated San Jose. During this time period, there were a lot of Mexican colonias, a lot of Mexican American communities located just on the outskirts uh, of San Jose, predominantly on the outer edges of San Jose's east, east side. Uh, here you have a map. Uh, this map here shows what shows the size of San Jose in 1950. And then out here, of course, the outline in blue is San Jose during uh, in, in 1970. Uh, the, these dark colors 
represent the concentration of Latinos in, in, in particular neighborhoods. And so if you look at this map, right, right around here, you have the downtown area and then all of this, this is Highway 101, so all of this would be the east side. Um, if you put into context on this map, this is Highway 101 and this would have been the east side in 1950. So you can see the massive growth of East San Jose between these 20 years. And a lot of that growth is essentially the annexation of already established communities that are predominantly Mexican-American and Latino on the, east, on the Eastern side of, of the city. Uh, it's worth noting that the black residents of San Jose have never comprised more than 5% of the total population. In 1970, nearly 11,000 black urbanites in San Jose made up only 2% of the city's population, but uh, was home to 60% of Santa Clara County's uh, entire black population. These numbers are particularly small, especially when you consider the concentration of black residents, black urbanites living in places like San Francisco and Oakland that were not very, that, that are not, that are located not very far from San Jose. Uh, so what explains the demographic divergence uh, with the low number of African-Americans located in Santa Clara County and San Jose and those located in Alameda County and San Francisco County? Well, a lot of it has to do with the wartime economy. Uh, during World War II, you had a massive influx of military spending uh, and particularly around ports. So you had cities like Los Angeles, cities like San Diego that grew tremendously and drew a large number of African-Americans and black people from the South that were leaving the rural and agricultural uh, economy and jobs that were found in that area and looking to find more industrialized, better paying jobs on the West Coast. So because of the shipyards and the war industry in San Francisco and Oakland with the ports, you had an influx of African-Americans moving to those port cities to find higher paying jobs, more industrialized jobs. The jobs that were located in Santa Clara County and San Jose were predominantly still uh, very much uh, associated with the canning industry and with agriculture. And these are the types of jobs that African-Americans were actually trying to leave uh, because those are the types of jobs that they were actually employed in in the South. So that kind of explains uh, the reasons why, so, some of the reasons why uh, African Americans and Black people from the United States never really made their way to Santa Clara County and the large numbers that they did uh, in Oakland or San Francisco. Um, I share this information because the primary focus of today's talk uh, is Mexican American or Chicano struggles for civil rights in San Jose. Explaining the demographics of San Jose helps explain why the issue of civil rights was mostly characterized by Latino, Mexican American, and Chicano political action and not by uh, activities uh, undertaken by African Americans in the county or in the city. Um, between this time period of 1950 and 1970, Latino social, cultural, and political life was located in San Jose's downtown, especially along First Street. Here you have a map from the census, and I've kind of color-coded it for my own research reasons, but this is First Street, and out of 14 uh, census tracts that were recorded as having significant Latino uh, populations, half of them were located along First Street. Uh, so, so Latinos were living along First Street, and as such, a lot of businesses and a lot of a lot of businesses, a lot of services for Latinos were located along First Street or along Santa Clara Street in the downtown area. However, after all the annexations and the influx of Latinos, the center of Latino life eventually became concentrated in the East Side neighborhoods and away from downtown. So again, here you have the East Side in 1950, and eventually this whole area becomes engulfed by San Jose and becomes eventually becomes the center of Latino political activity. But before this shift, downtown was crucial for ethnic, Mexican, social, cultural, economic, and political activity. In fact, many Latinos worked or owned their own businesses downtown. 
Many white-owned businesses advertised in El Excentrico, which was a bilingual newspaper published in San Jose between 1949 and 1981. Uh, in addition to advertising in the newspaper, many Latinos worked in these white-owned businesses. Two such businesses that advertised and then employed Latinos were Gallen Camp's Store for Men and Hoffman's Store for Men. Uh, the ads reveal the importance of Latinos as patrons for business, uh, even for white-owned businesses in the downtown area. Uh, here um, in this center image, uh, this is actually a business directory for Latino businesses and other uh, white-owned businesses that are promoting themselves in this bilingual newspaper. Latino professionals like doctors, accountants, real estate agents, and notaries also advertised in Eccentrico and had their office spaces downtown. Other Mexican businesses like restaurants and mercados, which are food markets, uh, also utilized the magazine as a space to promote their downtown businesses. The proliferation of ethnic Mexican businesses in the downtown area led to the formation of the Mexican Chamber of Commerce in the 1950s and later the Mexican American Chamber of Commerce in the 1970s. Many members of the Mexican Chamber of Commerce were actually first members of San Jose's Comisión Honorífica Mexicana, or Honorary Mex Mexican Commission. This commission was an extension of the Mexican consulate in San Francisco and promoted Mexican culture, especially through Cinco de Mayo and Mexican independence celebrations in May and September, respectively. These celebrations were known as the Fiestas Patrias, or roughly translated as Motherland Festivals. Uh, here you have um, a single de Mayo advertisement in El Excentrico, and then here you have the publication of the Mexican uh, national anthem that was published in the, in the newspaper. During these fest fiestas patrias or these celebrations, San Jose's downtown would fill up with ethnic Mexicans coming from as far north as San Francisco and as far south as Watsonville. These celebrations typically had a parade during the day and a banquet at night which turned downtown into a Mexican cultural space where the city's largest minority group really made its presence felt and known in the downtown area. Uh, the Mexican color guard would play music. They would play the national anthem. Uh, mariachis would fill the streets uh, and play ranchera music. Uh, there are images of women riding horses dressed in their chato outfits. Uh, and so really the downtown area was a social cultural gathering place for ethnic Mexicans during, this, during these celebrations, um, and then even in the banquets. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, many public figures, including the, the Mexican consulate from San Francisco, uh, state senators, mayors, councilmen, uh, attended these events. The Fiestas Patrias were important because they served an obvious cultural purpose, but they also served a political purpose. You see, by inviting local, state, and national politicians, members of the Mexican community, many of whom were Latino business owners, uh, were able to establish informal and formal personal and political relationships with local government officials. Often these leaders in the community were able to gain access to city government officials in their attempts to address issues in the Latino community. Uh, this was a very informal way in which San Jose Latinos made political inroads between 1950 and 1970, but there were more formal tactics utilized as well with civic and political organizations. Um, one such organization was the Community Service Organization or the CSO. Uh, the CSO traced its origins in San Jose back to late 1952 and was crucial to the development of an infrastructure that was geared towards politicizing Mexican-Americans in San Jose. The CSO established its second chapter in San Jose five years after its founding in Los Angeles in 1947. In Los Angeles, the CSO successfully assisted in the election of Edward Roybal, the city's first Mexican-American city council member since the, in the 20th century. Although never explicitly stated, uh, implications pointed to a desire of San Jose's CSO to replicate the empowerment and mobilization experienced by Southern California and elect a Mexican American to city council. The first advertising chairman for, for the CSO in San Jose was a man by, by Joe Flores. And he announced early in the 1950s that the organization's goals included, quote, 
improving the conditions under which Spanish speakers and other minorities in San Jose live and to secure their rights to equal opportunity in employment, housing, health services, education at the ballot box and before the law, close quote. The largest concentration of ethnic Mexicans in Santa Clara County resided in the incorporated and unincorporated area of San Jose's underdeveloped east side. Unlike other organizations that chose to situate themselves in the downtown district and concentrate their activities in the core, the CSO established its office and focused its energy in the Eastern periphery. Throughout the decade and well into the 1970s, the CSO worked to improve the lives of ethnic Mexicans residing in San Jose. A major focal point of activities surrounded the enfranchisement of Mexican Americans in the area. The CSO sponsored English classes, citizenship classes, and voter registration drives. The civic organization worked towards developing an infrastructure in San Jose like it did in Los Angeles to educate, inform, and mobilize the entire ethnic Mexican community. Efforts began by literally creating citizens, right, with their citizenship classes and helping people attain citizenship, uh, but then also registering and encouraging them to vote. In 1953, uh, the CSO correspondent for El Excentrico provided an enthusiastic and informative article on recent organization activities. He announced the registration of 4,000 new Mexican American voters, uh, bringing the county total to 23,000. Uh, the organization had promoted a get out and vote committee uh, that was headed by Cesar Chavez. Um, and in this announcement, he celebrated the first Mexican American deputy re registrars in Santa Clara County by promoting English to Spanish speakers, encouraging them to become citizens and registering them to vote throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s, the CSO helped create the foundation of a political infrastructure, one that would become essential to the rise of a Mexican American leadership in the decades that followed. By the mid 1960s, the CSO celebrated over 10 years of work in San Jose and aimed, uh, aimed at improving the lives of Mexican Americans and a new organization emerged to more explicitly uh, politicize Mexican-Americans. In the previous decade, CSO members worked to help Spanish-speaking immigrants earn their, citizenship, earn their citizenship, hosted English classes, and as I mentioned, sponsored registration drives. The CSO maintained a nonpartisan and apolitical stance, simply encouraging Mexican-Americans to participate, encouraging civic engagement within the Latino community. In the 1960s, however, some organizations were more explicitly political in their objectives and looked to improve and influence political elections. The Mexican American Political Association, or MAPA, uh, was a salient product of the 1960s. Motivated by, by political ambitions, MAPA worked towards creating a local, state, and national Mexican American voting bloc. Taking political engagement one step further, Mexican-Americans in California formed MAPA in 1960. In a summary report on the purpose of MAPA, the organization's state secretary reported that, quote, 150 of the most active Mexican-Americans throughout California met at Fresno in April of 1960 and decided that what was needed was an organization that would be frankly Mexican-American and specifically and exclusively political, close quote. One of the primary delegates lawyer and CSO member Hector Moreno lived in San Jose and was a San Jose native and served as the organization's first vice president. Promptly after the meeting in Fresno, Moreno wrote enthusiastically that, quote, for the first time in the history of California, an organization has been established that has its primary purpose, the betterment of people of Mexican ancestry through political action. Although actions taken by the CSO were clear, clearly political in nature, uh, its central goal never prioritized electoral politics. MAPA was distinctly in the business of impacting elections. Moreno unequivocally reiterated the importance of electoral politics when he wrote the following, quote, one of the first objectives of this new organization will be the election and appointment to public office of Mexican Americans and others sympathetic to their aims. It will also recommend increased activity and participation in all legal political parties labor groups and civic organizations, close quote. Oh, Alex, I'm sorry, is there a new slide for us? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, yeah, sorry, I missed the note. Uh, so here, 
Uh, you have Joe Flores, and this is one of his first announcements in uh, El Excentrico. And then here you have Hector Moreno, and this is one of the first articles that he wrote uh, in El Excentrico after being nominated the vice president of MAPA. Uh, so again, you have Joe Flores for the CSO, and you have Hector Moreno for MAPA. Uh, when the delegates left Fresno in April of 1960, it did not take long for participants to establish local chapters throughout California, and San Jose was no exception. Uh, running with the, with the momentum from the convention, San Jose MAPA began a get out and vote campaign and endorsed candidates for state and national elections. With advertisements taken out in El Excentrico, MAPA recommended that San Joseans vote for John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson for the presidential ticket in 1960. On September 3rd of that year, candidate Kennedy arrived in San Francisco and was greeted by a crowd that included many Mexican Americans as part of the Viva Kennedy campaign. Among those were MAPA Vice President Jose Hector Moreno and San Jose MAPA President Luis Eva. Uh, at the reception, Evia and California Governor Edmund G. Brown stood on a podium alongside Kennedy in front of the crowd and presented presidential candidate with the Chato Sombrero and a Sarape as a way of showing the support of MAPA and the Mexican American community as a whole. For decades, many community members and leaders believed having one of their own in city council might help alleviate some of the issues facing San Jose's ethnic Mexicans. Organizations like the CSO and MAPA worked diligently to register Mexican American voters and create a voting block to affect change through the electoral process. Organizations like these represented the old guard or the first wave of Mexican American mobilization of San Jose's Chicano movement. However, like elsewhere across the Southwest in the country, during the 1960s and into the 1970s, Latinos in San Jose, especially Mexican Americans, began to operate in less establishment oriented ways in their fight for representation and civil rights. By the mid 1960s, Mexican Americans in San Jose, especially those of a younger generation, were tired of waiting for change and began to take matters into their own hands in more abrasive and confrontational ways to bring about improvements in their daily lives. These younger, more rambunctious activists embraced the label Chicano and frequently found themselves at the forefront of the Chicano movement. Um, from here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about La Fiesta de las Rosas. Um, La Fiesta, um, perhaps no other event during the Chicano movement in San Jose, highlighted the growing class and generational tensions within, Mexican within the Mexican American community more clearly than the revival of the city's Fiesta de las Rosas celebration. The Fiesta de las Rosas was a quaint floral parade during the 1920s that celebrated the city and county's Spanish heritage. The event had not been celebrated since 1933 after it was discontinued due to the economic burdens of the depression. However, talks began in 1966 to revive the event. Luis, Luis Juarez and others in the emerging Latino middle class favored reviving the event to help revitalize a declining downtown. He represented the interests of many middle-class Latinos in San Jose who benefited from city growth and from suburbanization. After years of deliberation and planning, it was decided the event would take place in June, 1969. But many residents, especially Chicano youth and barrio res residents of San Jose's east side disapproved of the event. Many working class Mexican-Americans viewed the event as imperialist or Eurocentric um, and as promoting white and Spanish history of the city that ignored the many social and economic problems impacting Latinos in the city, county and the country. Middle-class Mexican-Americans in San Jose like Juarez promoted the revival of the fiesta, but many Chicano students at San Jose State University asked Mexican-Americans in the city and the county to boycott the event. While members of the Mexican-American Student Confederation at San Jose State falsely claimed that no Mexican-Americans were on the planning committee, they were correct in pointing out that the city-sponsored parade ignored major social economic problems facing the Mexican-American community, especially poor housing, high unemployment, and inadequate educational opportunities. Uh, here you have two images of what some of the neighborhoods in uh, San Jose's east side looked like in the late 1960s. So while other areas in 
the western and southern parts of San Jose were being developed with a lot of with with a lot of attention from city council. Um, the east side had been annexed, but had by law had been largely ignored with regards to providing social services um, and infrastructure. So here on, on the left, right, you see children kind of playing in an unpaved kind of area next to a sewer. And then on the right here, you have uh, Mexican Americans from the community actually building their own sidewalks uh, because the city was not building sidewalks for them. Uh, the students took more direct action than just imploring that Mexican Americans avoid the event. They actually attempted to suspend it entirely by suing the city for appropriating over $31,000 of the city budget to cover expenses. One student article claimed that the city spent upwards of $300,000 towards the celebration and that many of the areas over 100,000 Mexican Americans were without adequate housing and other important social and economic benefits currently enjoyed by San Jose's other 300,000 citizens. In fact, many of these underserved Chicanos made up the bulk of Mexican American membership in community groups like United People Arriba, uh, the Community Alert Patrol, and the Black Berets, who organized to combat socioeconomic issues in their east side and downtown neighborhoods. Many Mexican American and Chicano organizers who worked to address socio socioeconomic issues uh, in their neighborhoods had a vested interest in protecting and improving the spaces where they lived. San Jose's urbaniza suburbanization in its south and west ends decentralized the city and created more, more segregation. Latinos experienced the largest negative impacts of segregation with issues like poverty, police brutality, poor education, and affordable housing at the forefront of civil rights issues. However, like suburban middle-class homeowners in the county and the city, who shielded their communities from undesirable neighbors and societal elements, Latino working class urbanites in San Jose also owned homes and wanted to live in good neighborhoods. By the early 1970s, it was estimated that 55% of Mexican American residents of Santa Clara County owned their homes, while 44% um, who lived in the region were renters. As a way of showing their opposition to the Fiesta, Fiesta de las Rosas, Chicano students, uh, Mexican American homeowners, and some community organi organizers uh, gathered at the event in protest on June 1st, 1969. Most protesters congregated at the corner of First and Santa Clara Streets, awaiting the parade. Police had been informed of the presence of demonstrators who might disrupt the event and were sent to prevent disturbances. Uh, it still remains unclear how the violence started, but eventually, Mexican American demonstrators were beaten and arrested. Protesters in an attempt to protect themselves hurled chairs and other items that soon littered the streets. The scuffle between police and demonstrators lasted about 15 minutes uh, with officers chasing protesters for two blocks along the parade route. When the confrontation ended, there were about 17 Chicanos who were arrested, three were hospitalized uh, and several others had suffered minor injuries. Uh, it was estimated that somewhere about 75,000 people attended the event uh, and roughly a, only about 100 of them were protesters um, that represented some 35 Bay Area Chicano organizations. Police claimed that they were attacked and were therefore forced, forced to initiate riot procedures. Chicano demonstrators, on the other hand, claimed that the police overreacted and began attacking them unprovoked. Widespread news reports of the Fiesta de las Rosas present, presented the event as a ruckus, violent uh, event, highlighting the clash between Chicanos and Mexican Americans against police officers. The reports also provided a voice to protesters explaining their charges that the celebration purposely overlooked or watered down the violence and subjugation that occurred with, Spanish, with the Spanish conquest of indigenous peoples during the colonization of the Americas and California. The violence and use of force against the Chicano protesters during the fiesta reflected deep-seated beliefs and understandings of race in San Jose. The event helped solidify stereotypes of ethnic Mexicans as criminals who needed to be controlled and contributed to a clouded vision of ethnic Mexicans that was held by elected officials. Reporting of the event essentialized ethnic Mexicans in the city as troublemakers, essentially. However, 
reporters missed the internal class struggle within the ethnic Mexican community in San Jose and Santa Clara County. While a large, while a large, larger number of Mexican Americans and Chicanos voiced their opposition to the fiesta because of its celebration of Spanish oppression and its disregard for struggles of poor people in the city, there were also middle-class Latinos who supported the event as a way to improve the image of the city as a whole and attract business back to the downtown area. People like Luis Juarez viewed the fiesta as a positive, viewed the fiesta in a positive light um, and viewed the fiesta as a way to help San Jose reestablish an identity for itself that had been lost over the city's massive growth since 1950. San Jose's urban, urban sprawl seemed to eliminate feelings of community and Latinos like Juarez believed that the celebration of Spanish and Mexican culture during the parade would help improve San Joseans' pride in their city. After their violent encounter with the police, several Mexican Americans and Chicano youth sporadically gathered at an east side San Jose church and discussed the event. The violence of the fiesta and the sporadic meeting gave birth to one of San Jose and Santa Clara County's best coalition building organizations. San Jose Chicano Jesse Dominguez recalled, quote, that night after we took our beating, we went over to Guadalupe Church on the east side to, to lick our wounds. And that's when there was the birth of La Confederación de la Raza Unida, or the Confederation of United Latin People, close quote. Within a year, the Confederación opened an office in downtown, just above the model city's office, and represented not only a majority of organizations in San Jose, but the county as well. As one community member declared, quote, the Conf the Confederacion is a blanket organization representing 90% of them in Santa Clara County. The organization helps people with different problems to improve all of the Spanish speaking community, close quote. By 1971, the Confederacion represented over 200,000 Mexican Americans in Santa Clara County and was comprised of various social groups with members coming from various political, civic, religious, and educational backgrounds. Luis Juarez commented that, quote, even conservative, liberal and ultra liberal Chicano leaders have come together under the auspices of La Confederación to resolve their differences and form a united front, close quote. Arguably more successful than any other organization in forming a strong coalition among the diverse interests in San Jose and Santa Clara County, the Confederación was highly involved and at the forefront of several protests and lawsuits during the 1970s. Uh, here, here are just a few uh, news clippings of some of the activities that the Confederacion were involved with. Uh, they were highly involved in promoting fair housing. And so they threatened to sue uh, the city of, of, of Saratoga uh, for not providing enough, uh, for not providing enough housing for, for the poor. Uh, and in order to avoid the lawsuit, the city of Saratoga ended up settling and ended up building a few homes for a few, for a few families that were displaced. Uh, and uh, they were also involved in a lawsuit with Los Altos Hills. Uh, and they were also kind of at the, they were also at the forefront or some of its members were at the forefront of suing San Jose Unified School District in, in order to desegregate the schools uh, in the early 1970s. Uh, throughout this period between 1950 and 1970, Latinos in San Jose had really attempted to gain better representation for themselves and address issues that impacted their community. One effort that was always at the forefront was electing one of their own to city council. In the early 1970s, the Confederacion began a campaign to switch elections from at large, from at large to district elections. The effort to promote or the effort to move away from district elections and to at-large elections uh, really began to gain traction in the early 1970s with this push by La Confederación de la Raza Unida. And eventually by the late 1970s, the, uh, the issue managed to make its way on the San Jose ballot as ballot measure F in 1978 election. And by a very slim majority of about 51 percent to forty nine percent, the measure passed, and district elections arrived to San Jose in nineteen eighty. Uh, in nineteen eighty, Blanca Blanca Alvarado became the first elected 
uh, or the, the first Latina to be elected first without being appointed first to city council in San Jose. And the district that she represented was district five, which represents San Jose's east side. And from 1980 to the present day, the east side has been, the east side in district five has been represented by a Latino. And so uh, Latinos in local politics were essentially institutionalized in 1980 with the arrival of district elections. And it's also worth noting that the shift from at large to district elections in San Jose was not unique in this area, that this was, um, this was an action that was being undertaken in many other cities across the country, um, predominantly in cities where African-Americans and Latinos felt that they were not represented by the city council. Uh, there were lawsuits uh, against the city in order to bring, bring about the district elections. Uh, and then some cities actually took it upon themselves before they were sued in order to bring the measure up uh, and put the measure in front of its local citizens. Uh, San Jose was one of those cities that did not, that was not sued, that actually its city government actually decided to put the, put the issue on the ballot uh, before there were any kind of legal actions taken against the city in order to move away from at-large elections to district elections. Um, and that is the conclusion of my presentation. So I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, I'm wondering if you could, um, before we get to some audience questions and I have some questions for you, um, can you just expand a little more on the, um, the lawsuit uh, with Los Altos Hills? Um, yeah, I think some of our audience members would be particularly interested to hear a few more details if you can. Yeah, so, so they brought the lawsuit to Los Altos Hills essentially uh, suing the city for, uh, for racial discrimination in housing. Um, eventually, the judge who oversaw the case um, decided that it's, it's actually a very interesting case because uh, the, judge, the, the, the judge commented that although racial segregation was certainly taking place, the core issue was economic segregation. And therefore, just because Latinos couldn't afford to live in the city, that didn't mean that the city was that that the city wasn't that the city wasn't discriminated against them on basis of race, but it was it was more discriminating against them on the basis of economic income. And because it was based on economic income, that discriminated against everybody of all racial backgrounds equally. And so that is what ended up happening in that lawsuit. Um, the the Confederación de la Raza Unida, the president and a few other organizations were trying to, they, they pulled together money and they were gonna buy land in order to build affordable housing in Los Altos Hills, but the city stopped it because there's a zoning ordinance in the city that says that, uh, um, that that family uh, that residential that, that that residential that single family residential uh, homes need to be constructed on a minimum of a one acre land, uh, and so that in and of itself right presents an economic problem, and so when the Confederación de la Raza Unida collected money to buy one acre of land and then build affordable housing on it, that's kind of where the issue came up. Interesting. Uh, the old uh, race versus class issue, right, that continues to, to linger. Um, and I, I wanted to uh, also tackle another question here uh, from Ellen Wheeler, because um, I, I wanted to hear more about this too. I think it's fascinating. This, the, the downtown and downtown San Jose and mm -hmm you know, the struggling downtown, this ongoing, you know, and then the blight and, mm -hmm. you know, re redevelopment and all those politics, right? And embedded in all that, um, you know, a lot of folks in ethnic studies and Chicano studies would see racialization, right? 
racial projects in, in right. all of these, in all of this discourse say, that's seemingly neutral. So one of our one of our audience members also wants to hear some expansion. Um, she says, I'm interested in learning how and why it is that East San Jose became the hub um, of the Latino population and organizing and um, that, that power, um, that power shift between downtown and East San Jose. Um, I also yeah. wanted to hear more about that because it's very significant. I mean, the, the politics around, you know, who and who can be in bound downtown and businesses and, uh, you know, and, and how that's changed, I think it's right. really, it's really interesting to me and really important um, in terms of, of power and in, in racial inequality. So can you, can you offer any more um, details about that shift and the implications? Yeah. Uh, so I have so much to say. Uh, so in, it, it's important to remember and to keep in mind that <clears throat> although the East Side, the incorporated part of East Side, right, was very small in 1950, uh, there were already lots of Mexican Americans, Chicanos, uh, Mexican nationals living on the outskirts of San Jose and unincorporated county land, right? And when San Jose begins, it, 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 I, I call it the politics of growth, begins its politics of growth between 1950 and 1970 under Anthony Dutch Hammond, the idea is to incorporate as much land and incorporate as many people into the city to, to avoid uh, what Anthony Hammond called the balkanization of the county. Uh, and so in order to maintain San Jose as the largest city and maintain political power in the city throughout the county, he needed to annex a, a, a lot of these areas. So what ends up happening is primarily when areas on the west and south ends of the city are annexed and developed, uh, you have uh, ethnic whites, predominantly Italians, who used to live in the downtown area that eventually leave the downtown and move into these peripheral areas, right, in the newly developed west and southern ends of San Jose. And what you have then is, right, an exodus of people from the downtown area. Latinos remain in the downtown area and actually keep the area populated, uh, for about 20 years, and it isn't until 19, it, it isn't until the years of 1970 to 1980, we actually see a slight downtick in the population of the downtown neighborhoods. But what's happening during this time period is city government begins to disinvest in downtown, just ignores it because all of its emphasis is on building homes. Uh, a lot of city council members, uh, Anthony Dutch Hammond himself, actually owned a lot of land. And so it was in his best interest, it was in his own economic interest for development and to, to focus uh, the city funds and city development on the peripheries where he owned land. Uh, and so when you have this exodus of people, you have all of the, you have a lot of city money, city funding going to the Western and Southern end of San Jose. But again, the East side, maintains itself with its Latino population uh, and is somewhat self-segregated. Um, and so it also doesn't help that, it's, it, it, it's actually a really fascinating story, I think, because what you see happening in San Jose is what's happening across the country, predominantly with a lot of the major cities where you have white flight occurring, where African-Americans are moving into these large cities like Detroit, Cleveland, uh, New York City. And so then you have white people not wanting to be neighbors with African-Americans leaving the city. And so they're moving into the suburbs. So just as uh, you have the suburbanization of America, uh, you have this suburbanization of San Jose where you can kind of think of the downtown area as a city in and of itself that becomes depleted and divested in. And all of the funding goes to a lot of these peripheral areas and as you saw in those pictures of, um, of Eastside San Jose, because Mexicans live on the east side or minorities are predominantly uh, grouped together in the east side, that's 
that, that area doesn't get as much attention. Um, another interesting thing to note is that it's in the early 1970s when you have the construction of Eastridge Mall, uh, Oak Ridge Mall, and Westgate Mall. And so essentially what that does is that helps people stay in their own neighborhoods. So the, the idea is sold as you no longer need to leave your neighborhood and you don't need to go downtown in order to get your shopping done. You can shop in your own neighborhood, but an unintended consequence, or maybe it's intended, uh, right? Is that predominantly when you look at people living on the east side, there's less interaction between the ethnic Mexican, between the minority groups living on the east side and the rest of San Jose. And so that helps create this kind of racial understanding of what the east side is and right, these racial understandings of who Mexicans might be in the city uh, because there's, less, th th there's actually less contact with, uh, with these different groups. Oh, and I wanna add, I, just, I love that you really laid out the, with the Fiesta de las Rosas, the intra-ethnic um, tensions and politics in that case, you know, based around class. And that's so important. I think often we look back and really oversimplify the, the racial inequities as white, non-white. And when you really start digging in, you find so much more complexity, um, so much more complexity there. So I, I really appreciated that, that the, part of your- the, of Yeah, your I, I, I just wanna say that, that that was one thing that I wanted to, to get to in, in this presentation uh, is to try and move away from this understanding, right? That I, I, I think all of us as humans tend to do this when we think of other people from other groups, right? That we tend to homogenize them, that they're all this <laughs> particular way. And when we do that, we miss the nuances of the ways in which people within that community uh, either get along, with the, get along with one another or don't, right? Ways in which they collaborate with one another and ways in which they diverge from one another and there's tension. Um, and I think when we look deeper into, uh, deeper into these communities of color, uh, we can see that there are a lot of political, social and economic divergences uh, that actually lead to more interesting stories uh, because people are complex and so are communities. Absolutely. So. Yes. Thank you. I, um, I apologize. You might have heard my chihuahua. I always forget to get a sitter for my puppy. She can be very demanding. So you, you might have heard her barking at me. Um, oh, we have another question from an audience member that I'd like to get to. Um, from Luis Ambriz uh, says, I'm curious to know how Latino communities in San Jose and the Bay Area responded or reacted to other moments of Latino activism in this period. Um, for example, i.e. Zoot Suit Riots in SoCal, the Mendez versus Westminster case. Um, and you kind of alluded to this in terms of the um, uh, CSO, right? That. Mm -hmm wanting to replicate what, they, what they've done in LA here. But you know, are there other examples of that where folks in South Jose right, right. really rallied around an issue happening elsewhere? Uh, so one of a, I'm going to tackle this in a couple of different ways. Uh, so one of my major, I, I, I love reading and studying the Zoot Suit Riots, first and foremost. Um, that's actually one of, the one of the first things that I researched as an undergrad was the Zoot Suit Riots. And then when I got to graduate school, one of the first papers I wrote was on the Zoot Suit Riots because I was actually interested in what were Pachucos like? What were, what were the reactions of the Zoot Suit Riots outside of LA? Because everything is always about LA. Everything happens in LA, Zoot Suit Riots in LA, Pachucos are in LA. There has to have been other Pachucos in, in other areas. Uh, and so um, Cesar Chavez himself identified as a Pachuco and as a zoot suitor. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's somewhat unclear as to what happened in San Jose. Uh, I know in Oakland, there were actually some arrests that happened in Oakland. Uh, and there were right, these like mini riots that weren't as big as they were in Los Angeles, but there were these mini riots and there was a curfew established in Oakland. Um, but in San Jose, I think there was a slight curfew that was um, put into place, 
but nothing major. Um, if we move to 1969, right after the uh, Fiesta de las Rosas, uh, there was uh, a judge by, I forget his first name, but Judge Chargin, C-H-A-R-G-I-N, uh, who came under a lot of heat because uh, he was overseeing this case where a Mexican-American youth had molested his sister. And when he was giving his verdict, uh, he was condemning the action. And if he would have just stopped with the condemnation of the action, I think everything would have been fine. But then he went on to say that uh, all Mexican-Americans were savages, that he should be sent back to Mexico. Uh, that, and then he, he went far as, as far as to say that uh, something along the lines of maybe Hitler was right, maybe you should be exterminated. Uh, and so that happened here in San Jose. And there were a lot of protests here in San Jose about that in Santa Clara County. And eventually that was one event that helped galvanize a lot of Mexican Americans throughout California because there were a lot of organizations, a lot of Chicanos from Los Angeles that actually make, made their way up uh, to protest at the, um, at the courthouse here in, in, in San Jose. I love it. So it's also others responding to things in our community. Just a Oh, I just wanted to quickly join with Julie and say just a quick thing on, could you just describe the Zoot Suit Riots? Because just for those of us who aren't as familiar. Uh -oh. uh, so, so the Zoot Suit Riots, uh, so in essentially in, in, in Los Angeles, uh, are people familiar with Zoot Suits? It'll be kind of hard to explain the Zoot Suit Riots without people knowing what Zoot Suits are. Uh, here, I can pull up a picture. Maybe we'll just find a link or something about it, but it's a, it's a, well, so it's okay, just the so, time period, I think is what might be. So, okay. So, so, so time period is right before World War II, uh, happens in, uh, the, the event happens in 1943, or it's, it's actually right, right after we joined World War II, uh, the event essentially, um, there was this murder case in 1942 known as the Sleepy Lagoon murder case, uh, which was, again, that in and of itself was its own kind of racial project where there was, there was one Mexican-American youth that was found murdered, and there were about 25 Mexican-American youth that were, then that were thereafter arrested, and nearly all of them served prison time. Uh, there was never any proof that any of them were around the murder. There was never any proof that any of them uh, actually killed this person, but the assumption was that because they wore zoot suits, uh, that they were this criminal element. Um, one of the major things uh, about these zoot suits is um, that they're essentially kind of these um, kind of uh, they're just like very flamboyant suits that were worn during the time period. And as part of the war effort, people were supposed to be right conserving and being more conservative with uh, with things like cloth, food. And so a lot of people looked at these zoot suitors who were not necessarily, that, who, who were not, um, who were not just Mexican American. There was a lot of African American zoot suitors, a lot of Jewish zoot suitors, even a lot of white Americans who were zoot suitors. Uh, but when Mexican Americans put on these outfits or put on these suits, uh, there was this criminal kind of element that was attached to them. And eventually what happens is uh, there are these sailors um, off the coast of Los Angeles who board or who, who essentially get a night off and they go into Los Angeles. And while they've been on the ship, they keep hearing these reports about the Sleep Lagoon murder trial. And they keep hearing about zoot suitors that are Mexican American, that they're against the war effort and that they're not American uh, and that they're essentially criminals. And so these sailors get off their ship for their night off and it's a Friday night. So people, Mexican Americans are out in their suits, right? Kind of going out in the town and these sailors essentially see anyone wearing a zoot suit and begin to beat them. So they beat them, they strip them of their clothes. The police end up showing up trying to stop, uh, stop the sailors. But what they end up doing is arresting the pachucos for their own safety. Uh, and these beatings, these kind of clashes between sailors and Mexican-American civilians uh, occurs for 13 days in, in Los Angeles. 
that that might have been too much information, but I, I thank you for that it. brief uh, synopsis, Alejandro. I think there's um, there's a great film by Luis Valdez that our audience members might want to check out. That's very famous, and also um, a, a wonderful scholar at UCSC, Catherine Ramirez, wrote the book on Pachucas, on mm -hmm. um, Pachucas, because in her experience growing up, she grew up around women who dressed like Pachucas but never saw or heard them in any of the literature or in the film, right. like where are the women besides just like the girlfriend, right? The girlfriend or the, or yeah. the mom, it's, right? Uh, in in a lot of this work. So just to make the audience aware that there's, there's some good literature. On there's, that. there's actually an, another book called From Coveralls to Zoot Suits uh, that looks at women who were, who, who during the day would work uh, in the wartime industry uh, and then at night would dress up in their zoot suits or they would essentially uh, provide, so, uh, provide a social escape for, uh, for soldiers, right? By going to dances and dancing with soldiers. Uh, so it, that, that's another interesting book too. I'm, I'm interjecting with this um, flyer that I found that I showed you a few weeks ago, Alejandro. Mm -hmm. And it relates to the last question about connecting to larger issues and what was happening in San Jose. Um, Right. And I, I, I was at um, my, my significant other um, does a lot of projects with his homes and things. And, um, and so he was at it, the draftsman that, that he hires, he was at his office and looking at the, the, the blueprint and, you know, so all that, that stuff that needs to happen to do this project he wants to do. And I'm looking around, there's a lot of stuff in this person's office, his name is Agustin. And I see this flyer and I was just, my mouth dropped. And I know the, the, the writing is very small. So I'll just I kind of read off some of these things for the, for the audience. Um, on the right, the speakers at this rally held at William Street Park in San Jose include Angela Davis, um, among others. Um, and it's kind of cut off on the right side, but there are people who, um, you know, there's a mayor, there's someone related to the Vietnam War, anti-war effort. Um, and then at the bottom it says, and other speakers from the Chicano anti-war and women's movements. Um, and, you know, on the left, a whole list of sponsors of organizations from all over the Bay Area. And then, you know, some of the issues that were pointed out that were gonna be addressed, free Angela and all political prisoners, Stop the bombing of Vietnam. Set a date for withdrawal. Accept the seven points. I mean, I don't. I know some of our audience members know what the seven points were. I don't know what the seven points were. Maybe I read it at some point, but I couldn't tell you. Uh, addressing farm workers uh, and police violence against Black, Brown, Asian peoples. I mean, this could be a rally today, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a number of things that I react to with this. I and mean, this happened in San Jose, right? It's a multiracial, cross-racial, cross-issue um, organized throughout the Bay Area, you know, a, a coalition of folks collaborating um, and, and organizing this rally. And I just love that, that this person had this up on their wall. The date here is 1971 and they keep it because they graduated from, um, San Jose State in 1972, and it's just like a memory of that era and their, that time for, for this right. person I've seen the draftsman I was talking about. So, I mean, I, I already said a mouthful, I'm sorry. I just reacted so strongly when I saw this and I shared it with you and I'm wondering, you know, what, what kind of reaction do you have? What, what stories might we imagine that it could be told by just looking at this kind of artifact and what questions arise for you? Right, so when I thought about it, um, it, it, it's interesting with San Jose because the racial dynamics are so centered on, right, kind of a Mexican community and a white community, um, right? Post 1970, and post 1980, there's been a growth in the Vietnamese population. So now there's, right, lots of talk about the Vietnamese population in, in San Jose, but, Again, when we kind of homogenize a city or homogenize a group, we miss kind of the smaller 
intricacies that are happening within the city. Um, I know I didn't talk a whole lot about the black population and what the black population was doing here, but just because their numbers were very small doesn't mean that they weren't active in the city. Um, even though Asian Americans in San Jose weren't very large in numbers doesn't mean that they weren't participating in a lot of these political, um, in, in a lot of political conversations. Uh, actually, uh, the, the effort to, uh, to bring about district elections in San Jose, it wasn't, right, I, members of the, of the Confederación de la Raza Unida were in favor of it and helped start a campaign, but it wasn't until there was by and by uh, the largely white population in the city and then also by and by Asian Americans and African Americans that a coalition was actually built. Um, and I know for a fact that there were at least two Mexican American organizations, one black organization, one Asian or, uh, or organization that were behind the effort to move towards district elections and supported the ballot measure and helped push and advertise uh, reasons for district election predominantly as a way of uh, attaining better representation for themselves and their neighborhoods uh, in the city. And it's, it's actually really interesting to note, I, I, I was looking at this the other day and um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe San Jose City Council is a minority majority where there are something like three or four Latinos. Um, and then there's like two or three Asian Americans uh, and then about three or four um, white Americans uh, sitting on city council. So city council today, I think is better representative ethnically, uh, ethnically and racially of what the city looks like today. Um, and I think that in and of itself, right, is speaks to the power of coalition building and um, right when when you see flyers like this, it's um, it's important to remember that coalition building isn't something new, and that it's something that ha that might might have happened more frequently than we think. Um, and I, I think that's that's kind of the key takeaway is that uh, there's still a lot of untold histories, a lot of untold stories that need to be uncovered. Um, and when we can find instances and moments where it's not just one group fighting for something, but multiple groups working together towards a common issue. Uh, I, 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 I think those are fascinating. So. And, and I wanna know how many other folks in San Jose and the county have other artifacts like this, have photos from this right. rally, went to this rally, you know? I mean, this, this is really- What other events were there? Significant moment. Right? And what other exactly? And I, and I think also kind of, you know, something that you had also talked about is, <laughs> I think you said it, I think you said it very, very plainly and clear that San Jose gets no respect, right? Right. <laughs> so, you know, um, it, it's understudied and it's still uh, seen as kind of a sleepy town where not much happens and it's, it's not very politicized. And, and that's, we know, here, right, that that's not the case, but um, there's still so much work to be done. Um, I wanted to move to even larger issues, current issues, um, before we get to another audience member's questions. Thank you, audience, for your wonderful questions. We will be able to get to uh, one or two more. Um, but I, I really wanted to connect it to some of the things happening today. There's a lot of discussion currently about the fragility of our democracy and threats to fundamental democratic institutions in light of the one year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection. But also even before that with threats to voting rights of communities of color that communities of color were already organizing around. Um, what, what can we draw from your research that might help us understand or grapple with today's challenges to civil rights? Um. So I think one of the things that I'm trying to do or try to uncover in my research is um, I, I, I think especially as it pertains to Latinos is um, oftentimes we're thought of as people talk about the Latino vote now that it's like a thing. Um, but then people also talk about how Latinos are apolitical and they're not politically motivated at all. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm trying to do is really put forward the idea that 
Latinos are political and we have been political for a long time. Um, and a lot of our political organizing has been around similar issues as right kind of the major civil rights issues that we think about as they pertain to to voting rights um, and right participating in our democracy um, and i think i think it's important to remember how hard people struggled to get the right to vote in order to continue to fight for them to continue to have the right to vote. Uh, sorry for being redundant there, but right, they struggled for, people, people in this country have struggled so long to find political representation. And what you see now is a strategic and systematic attempt at circumventing the ways in which people have access to the franchise. Um, and I think we need to remember the struggles uh, and not take those struggles for granted. Um, because again, we're in that fight again, and it, it, it looks different, but it's very much the same issue. It's having access to vote. It's just now you're legally allowed to write to vote, but how likely are you to vote if, right, polling, if, 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 vote, if, 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 if voting places uh, close earlier in, in your neighborhood, uh, if, uh, if you have 30,000 people that live in your neighborhood and there's only one place where you can go and vote, uh, right? It's not just a matter of giving people the right to vote, but making sure that they have access to vote. Um, and by access, having enough um, uh, voting locations open, making sure that they're open at the times in which people can actually show up and vote. Um, and so, right, th this idea that mail-in ballots are uh, somehow fraudulent, uh, right? Things like that need to be dispelled. Um, I think, I, I, I hope that kind of answered your question. Thank you. Yes, Elizabeth, did you, did you want to chime in? Oh, I, um, I, no, no, that was, that was great. I was, um, I think you had said a couple of more questions from the audience. Yes. So I, I wasn't sure if, um, yes. If you wanted me to do those, or if you were gonna, I'm sorry, I was, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. I just wanted to make sure you, if you had a question that you wanted to highlight that, that we got to it, but our, you know, in our chat, there's there's a lot of great it's comments been... about remembering my conduct and strong support from the Chicano community of San Jose. Um, gosh, just the Black Panther Party of San Jose had headquarters on the east side on Hamer and by the Pink Elephant. Pink elephant, everyone's a pink elephant, and the Guadalupe Church. Um, so it's just wonderful comments in the chat that, that we will see and share with you, Alejandro. Um, but I, I was wondering, I think I guess I did have about... like a little bit of a follow-up to that question in, in terms of the because I think there has been some discussion of, of redlining and um and the war on poverty um that I, I think are you know Pre, much older than than some of the the modern issues that you just brought up Perlita but that definitely I think our, our audience was also interested in some of those more systematic efforts that um, you know that and so anyhow yeah there's just been great comments Alejandra I hope yeah. we're able to let you see them all um, as you get into it but um, there was one specific I, one about uh, Mountain View that I thought was kind of interesting too. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure we could get to the Mountain View one since we're the Los Altos okay. History Museum. Well, you know, that gets to one of my other questions, um, Alejandro. You know, we are at Los Altos History Museum. Um, we have a lot of folks from San Jose joined in, tuned in, but, but also a mix of people. And so I want to ask you, you know, this research heavily focused most, uh, on San Jose. I know I know your work overall is not just San Jose, but this presentation was, was mostly focused on this city. Um, why should the Los Altos community take interest in learning this topic um, about Chicano Chicano histories and understanding the distinction of these, you know, the diversity within Mexican, Mexican American and Chicano communities? Um, and particularly when so much activity is, is based largely in San Jose, um, not to say that there isn't in some of the other county cities, 
but well, why should people care in Los Altos, right? Like, why are we doing this presentation here at this museum? Uh, so, this kind of ties into your previous question when you talk about, right, kind of, if, if we extrapolate the question a little bit and look at it as from, from a country's perspective, right, or from a democratic perspective, what it means for the country, uh, what it means for democracy. Um, San Jose is 15 miles away from Mountain View or Los Altos or anyone or 20 miles away from like Palo Alto, I think. Um, and San Jose is not thought of as a major city, even though it's the 10th largest in the country. Um, we don't talk about the political activity, the political struggles, the social economic struggles that occur with the ethno-racial minorities in the city. Um, and so I think it's important because for people right, that live in these suburbs outside of San Jose, I think it's important for them to know that these struggles are occurring closer to home than they think, right? And that just because they hear about discrimination happening in places like Ferguson or right, places right kind of in, uh, in the Rust Belt or in the South, uh, right, with a predominantly, with right, a, a, a lot of the issues that are highlighted um, in the media most often are with black people, right? This country has been founded on a kind of black white paradigm. And just because the issues here in San Jose aren't on a black white paradigm doesn't mean that they're not significant, doesn't mean that they're not important to the people in San Jose or people in the general area. Um, and if we kind of ex extrapolate that a little bit further, the demographic shifts in this country uh, have noted that um, if the growth of the population continues to go as, it, as, it's, as it's been trending for the last 40 years, uh, by 2050, one in every five people in the country will be of Latino descent. So I think it's important to understand the ways in which Latinos, Mexican Americans, right, predominantly here in California, in San Jose, what kind of things have they, have we been dealing with? What kind of issues are we struggling against uh, so that people are familiar with our struggles so that they can better support us and so that we can better support them as well um, at some point in time, because it's not just one, one way, right, where we don't need we don't just need the support of other people, but we ourselves also need to support other people when they have issues as well. Do you expect, um, Alejandro, do you expect that the, the, what I understand from your presentation is that the zoned, um, that instead of it being at large candidates to, to city hall made a big, big difference in the racial makeup of, of city council in San Jose. Yes. Um, and it are, is there any, do you continue? Do you expect that to continue to be the the case? Is there any counter movement now against that? Um, and also, are you seeing that replicated elsewhere? Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, the district elections came to San Jose in 1980. Right, it was voted on in 78, and the first district election happened in 1980. Uh, but since the late 1960s to 1980, there was something like. Uh, I, as far as I know, I'm, I'm sure there were more, but there was upwards of like 20 cities that were making the same move of moving from at-large elections to district elections because they disproportionately um, underrepresented people of color. Um, and so that was one of the major reasons why um, uh, organizations like the NAACP, um, the uh, MALDEF, uh, started to sue cities uh, using uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act uh, or the 1964 Voting Rights Act um, as a way to show that legally we are not being represented and it's because this is a discriminatory voting system. Uh, when it passed here in San Jose, as I mentioned, it, it passed by a very, very slim margin. It was like 50, it was more like 50.5% to like 40.5%. It was very, very close. Yeah, so it, it, it almost didn't pass in San Jose. Had it not passed, I think people behind the movement probably would have taken to the courts um, to try and sue. Um, I don't see the city, I haven't heard anything of going back to at-large elections. Um, the one thing that, that I will say is that even in 1980, 
uh, San Jose is broken up into, uh, I can't remember if it's 10 or 11 districts, but even at the time, some people argued that that number of districts was too small, that 14 would have been better. Uh, there's actually a legal definition of when you district a city, how many people need to be represented um, in, each, in each district. Uh, Chicago has something like 50 different districts. Um, and so it was recommended that San Jose have 14 in 1980. Uh, San Jose hasn't shifted its number of districts since 1980 and the population has continued to grow. So maybe down the line, I might see uh, right, a movement to make create more districts, um, but I don't mm -hmm. see the districting going away. Well, and as long as there's segregation, which there still is, racial segregation, mm -hmm. right? You need the districting. And, and would you say that San Jose, Santa Clara County, you want to expand it to Santa Clara County, has become more or less segregated? What are you, what were you seeing in your research? Have, have we become more segregated? So something like 70%, I think, of the Latinos in Santa Clara County live in San Jose. So I think that number in and of itself kind of answers the question. Um, mm -hmm. The numbers and even have within so San Jose, I would argue. Right, and then even within San Jose, right? There, you know, there are some neighborhoods where it's like, yeah. you, you feel like you're in a different town. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 There was an so, interesting I, question. Oh, I'm sorry, Perlita. Excuse me. No, no, go ahead. There was an interesting question in the chat um, about the businesses that I think it was um, kind of along with the political rise of getting more representation through the districting. Um, it was there sort of a counter move where there was less um, economic or business because you started out your presentation about the first street and the business mm -hmm. district there. And you talked about the businesses moving to East San Jose. Um, right. So there was a comment in there about like, so it's interesting if there was sort of a decrease in economic power, even though there might've been a slight increase in, in, in political power. In political power, yeah. So um, I would, yes. And a lot of the economic power actually doesn't necessarily have to do with the businesses, but it has to do more with the types of jobs that people have access to, uh, right? With the arrival of tech, right? The, uh, I, I didn't really talk about the tech companies or the shift from agriculture to hardware and now software uh, in the county, right? That's predominantly uh, focused on places like Mountain View and Palo Alto. Um, the interesting thing about San Jose, right, is that because there was so much emphasis placed on the development of homes on the outskirts, the city really missed out on trying to attract a lot of these tech companies. So San Jose is in some ways, one of the largest suburbs in the country uh, and not necessarily a city because more people leave San Jose for work than they come into San Jose. And when you think of a city, right, you think of economic production and people going to a city to work and then leaving and going home to go to, you know, to, to go to bed. And it's the opposite here in San Jose. Well, we, we have one minute and I, I just want to thank you. I think, um, you know, I, I can't wait for your book. I know that you're, you're working on, um, you approach your dissertation as a book project, which is really mm -hmm. smart. I wish I had done that. <laughs> so I'm really glad you have, have the support and I, I wish you all the best. I know you're defending very soon and you're teaching and you're wrapping up that dissertation. So congratulations in advance. And um, thank you for uh, working with us on the Diversity Advisory Committee. And I'll let uh, Elizabeth give her announcements and close the show. Oh, well, Good thank you. Evening. And thank you so much, Perlita, for, for organizing this. And um, Alejandro, thank you for your presentation. The Los Altos History Museum is, is very honored to have the advice and the, and the help of the Diversity Advisory Group as we move forward um, in uh, creating a new permanent exhibition and creating programming like tonight. Uh, the Los Altos History Museum is um, always free, open to the public Thursday, Friday, 
Saturday and Sunday from noon to four. Um, our current exhibition is about um, a self-taught artist who was interested in history in, in the area up here. And, um, and, and then actually later in her life in the 70s and 80s, her, her work did get a little bit, uh, she was trying to really reach out and start understanding the diversity of, uh, of our area as well. So it's an interesting to see like a, a farmer girl from, from uh, uh, Croatia start to understand some of the racial dynamics of America as the longer she lived here. So anyhow, we certainly invite everyone to come to, to the museum. Um, and we just are very grateful to our two presenters tonight. Thank you so much. Um, this will be recorded. It will be posted on the museum's YouTube learning channel and a link will be sent to all of the registered participants. We just had great questions, all sorts of wonderful chat. We didn't get to all of them, but we we're very grateful for all of you who attended and helped make this a, a very dynamic evening. Thank you everybody so much. And we hope to see you at the museum soon. <laughs>